from his point of view. It's all your subscription because when you do the new thing, which for him was you know two right. years old, <laughs> you, some people will come. Right. Yeah, I mean, so it's. No, I, mean, I respect Alan Brown. I no, 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 and that's part of why I was so well, I staggered, think, because I thought this doesn't seem to be the same person that I know. I so. think part of what we, when we heard it this morning, and we were talking about it at lunch, and I'm sketching in pencil, so it will sound a little messy, but one of the things that keeps coming up in the conversations about engagement and engaging audiences and there was a lot of conversation across the board. It seems the theaters in Chicago are doing a really good job of identifying audiences for particular plays. So being able to look at each play and go, who's the person, who, who are the people that this might resonate with? And you know, Regina was talking a lot about the, the length and complexity of the conversations as she's matured as a writer about who's coming and who should be coming and what that should. And, are, are, as we look at changes in the ticketing model, which is, a, let's not get into that conversation in the regular way, but are we looking at creating a different mix of subscription and single ticket, and what is the pressure that that puts on you, and where does the artist, where it came in in the three-way, it's where can you involve and engage the artists more in making it easier or more effective to find those individual single ticket buyers because you know how does that work and what is there some sweet spot that we can begin to find that mitigates some of and how do I mean help me a little we talked you were there this morning Lauren, talking a little bit up about the ways that playwrights and your experiences and going in and saying this is who I'm thinking about this is what we're doing here and the time issue that we came up against this can you help me a little yeah, bit? Well, yeah, well, and Tanya was speaking a great deal about this as well, that sort of the, the difference between timeline for artists who are going to work at the theater versus the time that marketing is creating materials for that show. So we talked a little bit about how, especially larger theaters, especially theaters like the Goodman, are marketing a brand, that they're sort of marketing an edifice as opposed to each piece of individual work. <clears throat> so one of the things that we were saying this morning is... And, and I came up with looking less, too, about what happened and how it changed when you had a home, right. as opposed to we're on the road all the time. Exactly. And what's the good and bad in that conversation? And looking at Adam's Karen, Janet, I have a business card. No, I have Rachel. None of the, none of the above. Rachel. Uh, Rachel Kraft was saying that Looking Glass has, has sort of phrased their marketing more and more as though each show is an individual commodity. Each show is sort of its own. Thing. So as opposed to sort of a year ahead saying, well, these are plays, and then sort of trying to build engagement really close to the show when the artists are sort of already trying to get the show. Like, how do, you, how do you do that? How do you make that work? How do you change the model of engagement so that each method of engagement feels more tailored to that specific piece Yeah, but we do both. I mean, and... <coughs> That was my fear that Tanya would be here and I'd be here and we'd say <laughs> different things. Um, so there you go. Um, no, because the, the you have to, you know, if you've been around for a while at all, whether it's looking at or the good, then you have to have some kind of identity because you're not just selling tickets, you're raising money. And more times than not, raising money, you're raising money based on your, your brand, your identity. You know, why looking glass is good for the community. But um, there's a much greater influence on and access to single ticket buyers than there was before. So the, the kind of uh, strategic marketing that we do to try to find you know, a particular audience is enormous. I mean, you know, we have the Mary Zimmerman data bank. And when it's a Mary Zimmerman production, we tailor a whole campaign to those people because they have shown a, a propensity to be interested in her work or Rebecca Gilman or you know, whomever. So uh, it may be happening more than Tanya thinks, but that's okay. It's not her job to know that. No, no, she was saying it wasn't so much that it's not happening, but that when you've got new, if you're doing a brand new play, yeah. if you can get the artist in the room a year ahead of time oh. to talk up with your marketing team about what it, and that we are, it, it's, you know, you get stuck on that oh, yeah, no, machine, and that how do, it's, how does that conversation happen when you don't, when there isn't a history with the writer before? Well, the, the challenge is sometimes that, that a year in advance, the 
play, the play changes, the play evolves, right. the play develops. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, what, I think that's what she was trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. Not, yeah. not about the edifice versus What Luna no. Gale yeah. was <laughs> you know, a year before it started rehearsals yeah. was different than when it went into rehearsals. And so you try not to get out of whack with yeah, the necess necessities of, of brochures and stuff like that. And suddenly you have you know, a brochure that doesn't look anything like what Play right now, yeah. things the play is about, and that's when tears are shed. And <laughs> but well, but I, think, are I, I think one of the things that we were saying is that it goes, you know, it goes much deeper than sort of the graphic design. But the idea that we were sort of talking about the distance between the institution and the artist. Um, so of course, theaters are doing lots of plays. Some of you, it's one a season or two or three, and the room and it's larger, and the seven shows and the events and the fact that there are two different subscription models mm -hmm. for two different theaters in the space. Um, the idea that, um, is, it, is it possible to sort of, um, what can communication between the artists and the, because it's so interesting, a lot of the stuff that you're saying, nobody's ever told me before, even if I've, so you know, I had a show at Longworth last year, I did get sort of a proof of the poster, um, but when it came to sort of any ideas that I might have or any ideas that somebody in the community might have, to market that place specifically and draw in a larger audience or a more specific audience for that show, what are better ways that we might be able to do that? Mm -hmm. And I think some of the good models are <coughs> smaller companies where someone said, I have the privilege of being all of those things at once, right? Mm -hmm. I have the privilege of being the, the first who's programming and the marketing person, and, and it allows for a kind of immediacy to what you were going to say something. Uh, no, no, that's right. Like, I, I, it, it seems to me, you know, we're we're talking about, about risk, and, and it seems to me that there there is an audience that will go seek out new work, um, and and it's not a risk for them. And what we're talking about are the fringes around that, where an edifice does help to say, yes, it's a new work, but it's the good men, and you can trust us. So come on in. You know, if we're only asking the Zimmerman audience to come see Zimmerman. Then we're not we're not doing it right. Um, so so that that balance of and that's what you're you're talking about as well in terms of engaging the artist and and drilling down to what the play is about and, and the particular person that's that might appeal to beyond the the new work of, uh, audience. And also after the marketing has been done and those people have bought tickets to come and see Laura's play. What are the ways in which Laura or other dramatists can help educate and help to bring that audience along to um, get them into the experience? Right, because part of what makes, you know, part of what moves a person from being, you know, risk averse to be wanting to try something again is that they have a good experience, right? I mean, and by nature, risky means that you might not. Um, otherwise, it wouldn't be risky. So, and that's part of what I think we we found in the work that we did with Alan on the intrinsic impact work was how important um, what he called contextualization was. So, if the audience came prepared in some way to see the play, and that the most important way that they could be prepared to see the play was to know the plot, so we shouldn't be so afraid of giving away the end of the play. Um, that was the most important um, thing they could do to actually increase their, the impact of the play. And the second most important thing was to be involved in some sort of way of, in, of basically discussing the play afterwards, either in a structured environment, in the talk facts that we talked a lot about this morning, or with the person in the L or in the cab on the way home, or perhaps you know engaged in an online dialogue. But that discussing it afterwards made the impact deeper and last longer. So those are things where the artist can definitely, the, the, the institution can definitely help involve the artist in, in helping prepare the audience for what they're gonna see on stage and before they walk into the room and then afterwards as well. And that, you know, thinking about that so that it doesn't make the work less risky and, make, and and I don't think you would want to. You're wanting to do work that's expanding boundaries. 
but but does increase the probability that the audience will be impacted positively by the work and be able to process it. Is that true? I mean, the only reason I question that um, is because there's something that happened in England called Secret Cinema, where people would buy tickets to go and see a show, they had no idea what it was they were going to turn up to see. And this had a massive following, and I believe it still has a massive following. So is it really about us saying, oh, it's okay, this is what, it's, what you come into the theatre to expect when actually someone will read something and think they know what they're going to expect and still not necessarily see what they're going to expect. And is it actually about us saying to them, you're going to come and share an experience with us, come and share an experience with us? Should we actually be less apologetic about the fact that we are asking them to take the risk with us? It feels like we're all saying, oh, we're taking the risk. Oh, well, I don't think, no, I don't think it's that, I don't think, no, no, I'm sorry, if I, if I, if I, Kate, if I seem to imply that um, I didn't mean to, it's more about letting, the, preparing the audience for what they're going to see, so that, they, I mean, yes, we have actually lots of, you know, we had 60,000 surveys that we sent out, 19,000 were returned, that was in one study, and then we did another, so we've got tens of thousands of surveys, so we've got lots of data, and the data does show that if the audience is, if their expectations are better aligned with what's actually on stage, it's not apologizing for what they're saying, it's just telling them what they're going to see, right. you know, preparing them for it. If, they're better, if their expectation is aligned well with what's on stage, then the impact of the work lands more deeply, and if there is a way to be in dialogue about that afterwards, it's, it, its impact is deeper and it lasts longer. But that's not about apologizing and saying, oh, this is risky, I know you're going to hate it, but come anyway. Is this as opposed to having zero information about what you're going to Or wrong. Say? I mean, I, we've all been, I mean, I've gone to plays thinking yep. from, gee, yeah, yeah. that sure made me think I was going to see, that's not what no. this, that, they don't want. Right. And then was that a happy camper? It's essentially removing the barrier of it being a new title. That if I'm going to go see the importance of being earnest, I have some knowledge and expectation of what's that, what that's going to be right. because I've either heard about it from people, I've seen it before, I have some sort of cultural knowledge, whereas the new play, I don't. Right. And so the institution is going to, or some communication is going to provide that similar context of expectation that I have with a known title. But if I right. you mentioned too, though, Mistaken, but you know, some, some viewers do prefer the total experience and want to walk in the door. Absolutely. And so making yeah. the information accessible for those who want it. But if you opt out and just want to yeah. walk in the door, clean slate. Well, that to me, I think, is part of the right. challenge that I see in this whole kind of as you move away from a group of people who will support you and come see it no matter what it is to people who are making choices. And then you layer into that another subset, and some of them want to be told what it is, and other people don't want to be told what it is, and it's, you need X number of ways for it to be effective. There aren't enough hours in the day, and there aren't enough people, which is part <laughs> of why the goal here is to try and, you know, what are what are the, I mean, I certainly, I mean, we do a fair amount of this just trying to build an appetite, because that's our whole mission, is, you know, how can we use technology in a way to help deliver this in a somewhat not so labor intensive way so that people can in fact pick and choose what they want. And, and I think that's, I'm interested in what you've discovered, your folks coming to either your play or your, what do people want to know? I mean, do you think most people do want to know ahead of time? They don't want to know ahead of time? They want a little information, they want to, and the reason it matters, of course, is because impact suggests you'll come back again. I mean, I, you know, impact says maybe I'll come back next year, as opposed to if there's no impact. What do you? What do people want to know? I think they want to have availability, and then they can choose what they want. They want availability and access, and they can go as deep as they want. Right. For me, the bigger macro economic climate question that's really interesting to me is that. You know, I've been running Cloud Reaction for 18 years, and when we first started, there was like 100 theater companies in town. Well, maybe Deb can help me with the numbers, Rock. <laughs> you know, there was like 100 companies. And then like, in like 95, I don't know, and then like five years later, there was 200. And then there was 300, and now how many are there, if you include all the companies that just do one show and then go away, 400 or something? 
Millions and millions. <laughs> <laughs> so so millions and millions of cats. So we've become a cluster for, for making theater. It's super incredible. And just an honor to be part of it. And But we haven't quadrupled our audience size. We've quadrupled the number of theaters, and we've become a cluster for making and cultivating theater makers. But our audience is maybe flat right there, dwindled by three or five or seven percent. I don't know, somebody knows, right? And so, but we're in an exciting time though, because we have all these makers, you know, and the best way to get new audiences, I believe, is with new work that really responds to life now and what's happening, and that can push the form and use technology in interesting ways. So although we've overgrown ourselves a little bit as a, a, a vineyard that has just got grapes all over the place, you know, there's a really exciting time in the next five or 10 years to really make progress and win new audience members. And I think that's the big challenge for, for our community. And in regards to risk, I will say that in 2009, I was really fortunate enough to pilot a, a program with the Driehaus Foundation. They wanted to do a, a, a at the Goodman with a show called. And who is that? Because I'm not the so know. The Treehouse Foundation is a wonderful, really open-minded, smart foundation that gives to small dance and theater companies, and they're really leaders. And and just like Treehouse was with, uh, you know, stocks and market trading and analysis, they're really great with art, and they um, support a lot of our riskier companies and small mm -hmm. companies. So they were looking for a company that was doing a risky piece. I was like, we have a really risky piece. So we did a thing called the money back guarantee. If somebody came to this risky show and didn't like the show, the Driehaus money guaranteed the money back and they gave us cash and we had somebody in the lobby ready to pay you cash back. <laughs> <laughs> um, we should have called it big risk, big reward. And that's my big regret because people jumped onto the commodity aspect of the money back guarantee and they saw it as a commodity and they beat us up for like selling out. You know, doing- Say what? Well, people saw it as like we were treating the theater as if it was a commodity. You know, you can't give your money back. Okay, art, you know, art, art is a pure thing that you shouldn't be able to return. But we didn't care. We were just trying to get people out of it. We did get a nice feature in the in the Reader and the New York Times. You know, and, and a lot of people came to the show just because they were talking about the concept of art as a commodity over dinner, you know. Um, but we found the show was, was very... Um, uh, difficult. It had very touching subject matter. We had like four people of 3,000 ask for their money back. Yeah. So people took the risk. I, and I know more than four came because of it, you know. I think people, that once they took the risk, they found that, wow, all you had to do was get me in the door. You know, and, that, and, and, and so for me, back to my other point about the climate, we just need to, as we're trying to cultivate new audiences, what does it take to get them in the door? We're live streaming our show right now. Um, and we're doing it for five dollars a pop. It's not an equity. And I got cancer patients watching the show from around the country and on GBD.TV, and they're also live streaming Second City. And but you know, there's issues with with equity. There, there was we talked some this morning about partnerships, and Rachel suggested that we drill down a little bit about kind of community partnerships in ways that I think you guys are working a lot in the community. And one of the things that's come up, and this is no longer our fourth city is this is is the extent to which and again it's it's how do you find a way to do it that isn't completely labor intensive and you know how do we tease out but that as you build relationships with particular communities for particular plays, how can you then cross fertilize those relationships so that it doesn't just become, you know, this is of interest to to a teachers association because it's issues that deal with education and this is of and, and cross fertilizing that. And I wondered about some of your experiences. You know, it's it's almost a grassroots or is you know community outreach grassroots organization model. I keep thinking does does the advocacy model go help with city, the go for a subscription campaign. <laughs> <laughs> I mean what goes around goes around. That was the whole the whole premise. Right, but if people don't want to do that necessarily anymore then then, then you then go after then you go after the particular markets in depth. I mean, that's what's changed in the world, is people want what they want. want. They don't want what you want, want to give them. Right. Because <laughs> who are you? Right. And, okay, I mean, I'm cool. I, you know, I'll, I'll do whatever. I just want to get people in to see plays in the theater. And if they're not 
going to do <coughs> when we say buy these five plugins, you know, you will have a good, and actually we did a money back guarantee on subscription once years ago. So same, but they didn't criticize us for being a commodity for some reason. Because <laughs> <laughs> we kept the lower key. <laughs> 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 they actually were promoting it too much. That's what <laughs> Um, <laughs> but you know, that, that they're, they're, people are less willing to make that. that well, or less, and certainly, I mean, when, when you just said what they're saying, it's like listening, it's like me listening to my 17 year old, right? I mean, it's like they don't want, people are used to self curate. I mean, people self curate now. Yeah. And so, mm -hmm. but so, uh, partnerships, I mean, community stuff that you guys are doing. Yeah, totally happy to talk about that. Before we lose it all together, yeah. I, I want to actually pick up on Shoney's. Comment because I, I, you know, we we're ha we're happy to continue drinking the Chicago Kool Aid. You haven't been in the city as long, so I'd actually love to hear um, what you were referring to and like, you know, talk a little bit more about that because we're, um, we're, we, we we may be oh, sorry. at that that place. Oh, okay. um, so, but it'd be great to hear uh, and, and yeah. a, a more recent newcomers' perspective on on are we in fact actually measuring the way we think. And it's Related, it's really this kind of um, mid emerging level of company. I'm thinking about Stage Left and thinking about Live. Why are these guys who I run a program um, for the city where we take in applications from storefront companies and we do presentations year round um, and we get free space and uh, you know, some other support? And um, I've had to tailor the application this year to only accepting. Uh, world premieres are at the very least Chicago premieres. But really what I want is new work world premiere because what I'm getting is an overwhelming amount of Chicago premiere of a really good play, maybe by a young, newish playwright in New York, Annie Baker, Sam Hunter, these guys, you know, that are really wonderful plays and worth doing, but they're not new work. And a lot of times the reasoning behind it, from what I've been told, is what we need we need press quotes that already exist to bring in the audience. We need the we need the play that already had a time to review, just so we can so our audiences know what to trust. And are you are you taking applications from a sort of certain tier of organization? Like the organization has to be I'm making those up two hundred fifty thousand dollars or smaller, smaller, or are you accepting applications? No, I don't think I even have a, a stipulation on that. It might be if it's matching our grant programs, it would be under five million. Um, so you know. But I'll say, like, uh, having been someone who had to, like, read plays as part of the, you know, ad hoc literary department at a theater once, like, uh, when there's only four of you, uh, it's very hard to find a, new, a brand new play as sure. well. And that a second or third production of a new work is actually really important to that play's life in the new work field. Um, you know, the idea of a, a rolling world premiere in a single season or the second or third production after a New York run, I mean, that's hard sometimes sure. for a, 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 a risky play to get, and I think uh, a small company taking that on, I, I'd like, I would be thrilled to see that they want to do that work um, and invest in that play as a new play for Chicago audiences. I think because I am removing some financial risk for the companies, uh -huh. I hope I am, um, I want them to take the opportunity to go greater risk. It's way greater risk to do a new play. A lot of times the plays aren't ready, they're not told yet. We know. Right. right. How do you even find them if you don't pay a staff to That is a, that is a really right. important question. And I think that I, I'm very interested to hear that perspective of Chicago not being a city that does a huge amount of new work. As a playwright who is not affiliated with a company, I'm not an ensemble member of a company, I have found, having worked in New York and having worked in Chicago for a long time, that Chicago has way fewer entry points. So in other words, I'm not interested in starting my own 501 c 3 you know, to produce any work. It's a huge amount of, I'm 10 years beyond the point where I felt like I had the energy <laughs> to do that, you know, now that I'm in my 30s. Um, uh, you know, you, you do sort of get tired of making $15,000 a year on your art. Um, I, I think that one of the things that is wonderful about Chicago is that there are some young summer that do so much work, that generate so much work. I do think that there are not often ways for playwrights to sort of attach themselves to those ensembles once those ensembles have been around for a few years. And I think that that problem that you're having, I would love to submit an application 
I have never been able to because you cannot apply as a playwright, you have to apply as a company. And I think it's another tricky thing, is finding a young ensemble company in Chicago where if they want to use eight of their actors in a production, but my production calls for ages or ethnicities or any number of things that that company doesn't have, it sort of becomes harder and harder to make that work as you would Or Where your play is unpublished and how would they sure. find it in sure. the first place if right. it hasn't been produced and reviewed and, and sort of introduced to them as 25 year old artists. Right, before. and so then we want to kind of create that one thing New York does have going for it. <laughs> we were, this, yeah. is, this is a national conversation. We're not going to pop it. We're in Chicago now. We're in Chicago. Yeah. There, are, there are a lot of young companies who are, you know, <laughs> New York people are onto the playwright. The playwright's going to be yeah. one of the upward mobility, you know, um, for whatever right. reason. That's a, you know, companies tend to be playwright or director driven, and here they tend to be actor driven. Mm -hmm. What I've noticed. Mm -hmm. And just clarification, not that one good thing. <laughs> the New York theater is the New York theater. It, it has its own kind of rules and context and way well, in which it operates. The, the rest of the country kind of operates in a, in a different right. way. That's, yeah. that's equally, all I'm saying. Equally different from one region to the other. Yes. Right? Yes. I mean, the thing that, that is really, I mean, and, and something that never, we dealt with this last week, having worked in New York for, in a theater for 20 years, I don't think I, I, I hardly ever heard conversation about our, from me or from any of our peers about our relationship to the specific community as a civic entity, right? And when you travel around the country, you hear way more conversation, about, or you read people's mission statements, right? When I teach and I show different mission statements, you know, the Goodman has Chicago, or at least used to, because I haven't been last. The Hill of Chicago is in the mission, right? The place that you are is in is part of who you are, and it leads to a conversation, and I think a relationship. With, and in, and one of the differences is in New York, there isn't a relationship to the city because I don't know either. It's an artist arrogance, or there are in some little theaters in outer boroughs, in the boroughs, you'll know, right? So. This is this piece that again comes back to community is how do we, what is our relationship as we think about the people who aren't in the theaters, or we think about the people who are only coming some of the time, when we think about, you know, how, how do we relate to the other people in our city? It's like you're saying the, the, the audience hasn't, the tide has not, that part of the tide hasn't risen with the number of theaters. It's the same thing that made me mad when Laco said there were too many theaters. It's just, no, we're not there. So uh, how what is our what? What do you guys see us think about as your relationship to the, the civic entity that's in Chicago known for? In fact, as we all talk about, you know, the TCG conference where everybody left and said, "I wish we had that mayor," because he talked about the theater in a way that none of the rest of our mayors do. So I'm interested about that. Our mayor, the previous, <laughs> the previous. The previous. Oh. <laughs> 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 no, I know the. the Again, uh, keep myself out of the New York hole. No one cares. <laughs> it's okay. It's really okay. Oh, shut up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not watching. Oh, the, 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 yeah. the, uh, I know in, in terms of community, I mean, as Lori just pointed out, like, to get rich here from doing theater is really uh, not possible. Um, New York, the orientation is uh, national media. It's, it's a, um, because of the, in terms of the theater, because of the New York Times, it is a national theater center. And the New York Times, you know, according to the New York Times, Broadway is the American theater, basically, and how the health of Broadway is the health of the American theater. Mm -hmm. Now, that has nothing to do with reality, but that's the perception because, you know, we all live at the back of the New York Times. Of the theater. So people they want their plays done in New York because it will get a cachet in other parts of the country. Um, and my point is that since we don't deal with that, we're, we're dealing with being in a community and we don't, with all due respect to the critics here, you know, they're, they're not going to make people famous overnight um, by, by getting a good review in, in uh, some media outlet here. 
Whereas the perception of youth is that that can and does happen in New York, and people get very wealthy producing musicals in New York. Do you? So, is it the feeling here? We hear a little about this morning that the critics here will do people listen to them in terms of what to come see, as opposed to visibility. Right? We we learn to understand about three stars means you get listed. But in terms of do people listen, do you think? Is, what's the impact in terms of building a community? You know, when you talk about that community of theater goers and whether it gets bigger, is that impacted? Is, it, is the media not active enough in helping? I mean, where is the kind of... I think their power has been quite diluted in the last 10 years. Yeah. You know, just the read back in the day, the, when you were in the reader recommends yeah. little thing. Yeah. That was like 18 tickets a night yeah. back then. It was like, you know, yes! <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to have to cancel the show. We're going to have at least five people because we got that reader thing. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right, pull the reader advertising money out. We're not doing it. <laughs> but, but, but so... <laughs> it, and that's not the case. It's, no, it's been diluted, you know, so we have yeah. to find new ways to... to, to to hook our audience, you know, we have to go after them. We can't just rely. So, you know, well, two years ago, as I had this kind of artistic crisis, thinking about that our company needs to really do what theater does best: bring people together in a room, and not just tell other people's stories, but tell our community stories. So, we jumped from producing Chicago premieres to making our own devised original shows, and we changed our mission statement to explore critical social issues. Our first show was called Crime Scene, a Chicago anthology. It was about violence in the city, and, our, and we partnered with 20 different community organizations. We featured them at post-show town hall discussions. Now we're doing the same thing with cancer, with the American Cancer Society, Builders Club, and seven others. And we're working on a show about the education system for the fall. And that's what we did to survive, to make our work more um, sacred in the room. And it's, and it, I mean, our post-show discussions are 80 to 90% retention. And mm -hmm. the show now is just the catalyst for the real show, which is when the person who got brain cancer 34 years ago was supposed to live stands up and tells everybody that they live one more day that they were not supposed to be here. And, and so, you know, it, it's changed things for us quite a bit. And because you're a company, with, and the generative artists are in the company, they're, ob they're obviously directly involved in reaching out to those groups in the community, and that's just integral to the process. Yeah, yeah. And in some ways, it sounds like the wrong, but you sort of posit this triangle of artists, audience, and institution. And, and maybe this is more true here than others, but there are so many artist-driven institutions that mm -hmm. it's, it's mm -hmm. a more of, mm -hmm. the institution is less the mediator between artist and audience. It's more like they're part and parcel of the artists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what you're describing is really, I think, you know, it's direct contact. There's no media. There's, mm -hmm. there's an effort for, on the behalf of the institution to get those people in the door, to get those community members in the door, and that requires institutional structure. You know, it, that can't, that can't, that's rarely just left up to the artists to do. You need to have some institution getting that done. But the institution and the artists are so closely aligned that it's, it's almost more of a dialogue than a try. Right. And yesterday, one of our interns accidentally CC'd a bunch of possible patrons that I really the artist and the institution where we overlap, it, it, it was it was like sandpaper, it was rough. It wasn't dynamic tension, no, it was no, yeah, just, just, it was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to ask a question if I may, just based on some things that I was talking about with people in the parade as well as this morning. You mentioned the word catalyst, and that for you, at least maybe you meant it as a joke, I don't know, but you said that sometimes the show feels like a catalyst toward what happens after the show. And I'm wondering if, does that idea <coughs> resonate with anyone else in the room about the show's position in the arc of the experience? I mean, is the show always the end of the experience, or do you feel like that the show, yeah, well, we were talking about this a little bit yes, during the break, and I, I, I bring it up, even though you guys might not be familiar with either of these campaigns, just because I think it's, um, uh, there might be something that we could draw from it. I think that, obviously, if you're a very large institution, and the subscription model is working for you, and I think you're not having sort of the audience issue of bringing in more people, of having like a fresh influx of audience members, I think that, um, hey, maybe not a whole lot needs to change. But I think that 
especially if somebody does fewer shows a year, I think two really instructive Kickstarter campaigns of the last few years um, have been uh, the Veronica Mars movie, which has been basically a year uh, in publishing. I was a supporter of both. Veronica Mars movie, and then Double Fine, which is a Bay Area-based video game studio, which um, I think three years ago did a Kickstarter for an old-fashioned 1990-style point-and-click adventure game. Right? So they said, we want to crowdfund it. Um, the Veronica Mars movie wanted to raise $3 million. They did it in 10 hours, and then they raised, I think, $3 million more. Um, the Double Flying, I think they raised $3.7 million. I think they were hoping to raise $1 million. So the, the end point, right, so the final movie and the final game, as opposed to sort of being like, all right, well, we're going to sort of wait for a couple of years, and then we'll sort of, we've already bought the final product, and then the final product, the show, the, the end goal will be delivered to us. Um, it became about how to engage an audience of people who had already bought in over the course of a year or two years or three years. Mm -hmm. And so for both of those groups, it sort of became about how do we sort of not continually create content, but how are we asking our fans who have already literally bought in, um, subscriber audiences, new play 101 club, something like that, even with no financial engagement, can we create uh, documentaries of what we're doing? scenes? Can we create email blasts that have pictures of our actors? Can we sort of figure out a way to make the thing that we're having you buy into not be the ultimate thing, but it's more about that engagement over a period of time and engaging with a specific group of artists and towards a specific artistic goal and have that be an equally important part of the artistic process. Um, I don't think it's a, a sort of a relevant model for fair number of larger companies, but I do think if you're doing sort of one work per year, could that be useful? Could you do something three months out, six months out, eight months out, a year out, so that the final show, of course it's a given that you're going to go, but all the additional stuff is sort of creating that bond with the institution that you might not otherwise have in a single year. I just don't, you know, something that I hear from people who are reading the society of people People are interested in new work, but they're not interested in going to the workshop or the reading or whatever, right? Mm. And I just wonder what those what those experiences are along the way. Let's say you get people who do want to go to the reading or the workshop. You walk in, you watch the reading, you leave, or you do a quick talk back with the artist, and you you know, like how how deep can it go? How much further? How many? It, is it is it? I go to a reading and then we have a reception and then we have a party and then you email me when I get home and then we have the feedback on a blog. You know, like how far does it have to go to to keep people in? To, what is that year long thing? You know, if if we're even already having trouble getting people to the reading, how do you get them to the reading and further engage them and get them to the next reading? Mm -hmm. Well, Playwrights Horizons is doing something pretty similar to what you get in terms of that sort of online engagement. And then also with specific younger groups of people with discounted tickets and parties, um, you know, instead of like an opening night party, it's an opening night party. And it's like, rehearsals are starting, and here's a party, something like that. So I think that that's certainly and here's a party. one. And here's a party. There's a model. And here's some booze. I think that's certainly one model, but I think it, it, it also has started to become about, as opposed to just sort of um, perfunctorily tweeting or having a Facebook campaign or keeping in touch with people, how are we specifically generating content that is sort of towards the art, but it's not the art? Like, because, yeah, I don't want somebody to come to a development room. Like, it's no fun. I mean, well, I need my own development room. So how, but how can, we, how can we create engagement that is towards a group of people who have already bought in, that doesn't require a huge investment of time and effort for them, but sort of keeps them invested, keeps them involved over a period of time? So what do we what do we do to make them feel special? Like they're really in on something mm -hmm. in the very beginning. I, I think it was Rachel that said this morning that you know people that come to the reading feel like they've seen the play then and then don't come to the play, uh, even though they enjoyed the reading because now they've seen it. But that having uh, a window into the process is a teaser that works really well. That you're going to come and see a design presentation, or you're going to come. And hear a little snippet and you're going to come and meet the play, right? And you see, for, as far for as me, the, a lot of this is about, a, it's kind of the subtext of why the work is important to 
us at PDF is what is the extent to all these things are actually used to build audiences as opposed to deepening, right? How, how can we use it, A, to deepen the experience of people who are coming, but B, how do we use these things and get them to the people who aren't even coming in the door, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the... Rather yeah, than just feeding the faithful. And, right. right, you got to feed the faithful, but I don't know, is the faithful, you kind of have to really mess up to keep you know, and, and in a city like this, they'll, I mean, they'll come somewhere. It's not like they'll stop going to the theater, they may stop going to your theater, but they'll... But how, how also, what are, what are the ways in which, because we open it up, we're opening it up in a way that it brings people in who aren't there in the first place. You know what? Mm -hmm. Right? That's, it. That's also interesting sure. to me. So, you know, stuff that we've tried, which is hardly, you know, everybody here probably has done a hard nothing revolutionary. When we do topical shows that have a specific, so when we did Still Owls and the uh, 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 No Onset Alzheimer's, we partnered with those institutions that we do hospitals and Alzheimer's organization. And they'd never been to Little Mass before, but they came in droves to see that. How many of them come back to the next show or any show that season, much less the following seasons? You know, if we, we keep a pretty decent list of them, but it requires follow up and, you know, on nights that we have low houses and we can send them an e blast that says, as a world of best partner, you get a discount code of you know twenty dollars a ticket, and how many actually show up? I think it's probably very, very low retention. I mean, I think, the, and um, a, unless there is a, a real dedication, and that means staff time and hours dedicated towards maintaining those relationships beyond that one show, um, I think the return rate is probably. Smallish, or at least that our experience is that it is. It's still worthwhile, and we feel like every time we reach out to those organizations, great victim advocates, when we did trust, we've kept a very steady stream of, of, of good communication with them. But how many make it back in to see a show that doesn't have that particular thing that's foremost on their agenda? Not, a, at least, I, I don't think we've had a huge success rate with that. The, the partnerships I think you probably might have been referring to before with that we've um, got support from. Duke Foundation, but it's this civic practice lab, which is supposed to be working, which is working specifically with non-arts organizations, um, with Michael Road, and um, that is fantastic, and hopefully raises the profile of how theater artists can be assets in the community at large. Um, whether it will build audiences, which is what we also want, that feed the institution generally, I, uh, you know, we hope it will. We certainly hope it will have the people who do those workshops and go, theater is great. Why didn't I know that before? And I'm going to go buy a ticket. Um, or, you know, or maybe because they're offering a discount because I participated in this workshop with them, then I'll go see a show that I might not have gone to before. And eventually, over time, a percentage of those people will become regular theater covers. That's our fantasy, but I don't know that it's. The verdict is certainly out as to whether or not it remains. And what is he specifically doing when he goes out? I mean, what, what are they doing? So we're working on, uh, with Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events, we're working with the Chicago Parks District, uh, working with Roosevelt University, um, and he will, uh, basically he uses his, uh, and again, these are, these are tools that lots of organizations use, um, but uh, to work with those partners to identify what their challenges are in, within their organization or within outreach to their communities and use theater as a tool to help problem solve mm -hmm. and troubleshoot mm -hmm. around those challenges. So uh, literally it means last week or two weeks ago they with the park district managers, uh, three different parks because the city is instituting uh, cultural centers in 15 different parks around the city. So working with those park managers and saying what are the challenges you guys face? What are the challenges you, that three different parks have in common, let's do some scenarios that will help you figure out how to better solve those um, problems. Or it, it may take lots of different forms and he's a bit of a genius in figuring out what's going to best solve that. Um, that question is, that, that um, but um, so I, I have no doubt that it's going to, that he's going to convince, you know, his genius is going to be on full display and it's going to convince those participating partners that theater can be a really awesome tool in their communities, whether we'll to address their, their needs. Except, exactly, which is fantastic. And it's Lucas's name out there, and I think it 
build support community wide for the, uh, the notion of the arts as not just segmented and, and as actual, actually useful in, in community. But um, uh, whether it will get people in the door or whether people who aren't participating in those workshops, in those partnerships, greater in Chicago generally will go, you know, I read an article about how Open Mass is doing that. Even though I'm not participating in that, I'm going to go see Open Mass show, or I'm going to support Chicago theater because I now see how theater at large is a much larger asset than I knew before. <coughs> yeah, you're talking about actually like a deeper web of impact. It's kind of interesting because that's an artist who's got a grant kind of through, through you guys, very much through you guys, working with a civic institution that is extremely widespread, right? We have like 500 parks throughout the city. And getting those park supervisors who are a wider range of people, maybe their background is in athletics, whatever, you know, so you get really engaged ones, you know, you get really busy ones, whatever. So they're going to that level of leadership. And then someone like Collaboration did a project last summer throughout the park district. So now those park leaders understand theater. So maybe it doesn't bounce right back to looking for it. It does this thing of risk taking on that park district leadership level, which is great. And they're going to be more likely to open their doors to Anthony. You know, mm -hmm. or to stage left or anyone, you know, and then it can keep webbing out, which is exciting. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that, I mean, this gets to more big picture stuff, I think, in long term, mm -hmm. but I think it's a part of your package. Um, and I, it, it started out here in this room as outreach when I was working with Victory Gardens. And I know, for example, my boys have both uh, uh, been a part of the playmaking experience, the looking glass. Uh, uh, brought to them at Bell Elementary School, and now their students at Lane Tech, where they go, where Chicago Dramatist does their outreach. And, but what we did here for five summers, and then one summer over at the Biograph, was to bring nine or 10 high school students who were selected by drama teachers or English teachers or were simply theatrical um, around the table, and I tried to teach them how to write a 10-minute play. And it was, the program took place over six weeks. We met um, two times a week, and they had to make a commitment to it. And then at the end of it, we put up those short plays with professional actors um, in a reader's theater fashion. They were involved in the rehearsal process. They got to speak directly to the actors, because I was the director, and I encouraged the playwright to talk directly to the actors. And then we had an event in this room where those students could invite all of their family and friends, and we filled the place. And what, you know, the first time we did this, I just thought, oh, well, this is cool. But then I began, and then there was a little party afterwards. You gotta have the party, right? <laughs> Not out the hall, sorry. But what was great was that these are, a lot of people I don't think had ever been to Victory Gardens before. Some of them had may never been to the theater before. But now they've had that experience. They know where to park. They know where the front door is. They know what the seat feels like. And going home, they got to have this interaction with, or hopefully it was happening over six weeks, with their teenagers about this whole theatrical experience. So we did it five summers here, and then we did it one summer at the Biograph. And I think it was a really cool thing. But again, it was, it was all about thinking long term in terms of trying to get those people who might not ordinarily come to the theater or a theater in the door. And maybe there's, sorry, um, uh, you know, uh, building audiences is one way that it can be measured. Like, is there a retention rate or what percentage of those people actually come back to that institution? That's one way of measuring it. But maybe there is some other less, I'm sure, less measurable, less tangible metric, or not a metric, less tangible thing, experience. Because what you're describing is a lowering of barriers and an experience of theater that they wouldn't have had. So it's not, and there's sort of no way to measure this, but it's not this alien thing anymore. It's not this thing they haven't done before and have no experience of. It's now something they have some experience of. And maybe there is some uh, intangible <coughs> audience building thing that attaches to that just by virtue of it not being as foreign to them as it was, as it was before. I don't, I don't know how to measure that. I'm just saying, uh, 
for my day job, I work for comedy sports and I sell corporate workshops using improv to, to build teams. It doesn't translate to a performance mm -hmm. ticket. It's using, but I think it's a very, maybe uh, an entirely separate conversation about the value of art and of what we do and how it can, can um, assist in corporations and in organizations beyond a performance. Um, but I, 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 I know for pretty certain fact that it does not translate to ticket sales. It's a powerful tool and it Maybe opens when the you're eye. doing that work, you're not sensing that People you're increasing not. anyone's to come to comedy sports. No, however, it might. It actually may work the other way, where if I have an audience member in my in, that's at comedy sports and they enjoy that experience, and I can tell them, "Hey, I can come to your company and tell and tell you how to function as as kind human beings," um, that they might do that. And they like that. They, they like that idea. <laughs> they, they do like that idea, but but I don't see it. I don't see people taking a taking a you know a comedy sports team building activity and then buying uh, a ticket to see comedy sports. It's interesting, in that example and, and over here, like you're, you're actually putting in the, in the triad that we're describing, you're putting the audience into the artist's chair there for a mm -hmm. moment and letting mm -hmm. them have that experience of, of generating or participating, mm -hmm. um, even if it's co-creating co with a professional artist. And that's, I think of that as like maybe the deepest level of engagement is being a practitioner that you never, you might never love something more or you might never understand it better than when you try it yourself. <coughs> and, and I wonder if without creating an entire, you know, uh, outreach program, can we do that with the work that we already make really well on stage, like our best, our very best work and our most committed artists, is there, are there ways to, to create that moment of making for audiences. I think maybe Anthony, you're talking about that in, in a way that are you guys inviting people well, we, into interviews have been we've been doing online surveys and interviews to gather dramaturgical research and yeah. actually quotes that are ending up in the show. Yeah. And we found that the person when we if we interview them in person or online with the survey, they're much more likely to come to the show and but I think the front line here is we have 100 people, let's just think of 100 people, that see their first piece of theater ever. A certain percentage of those people, let's call it 3.2, are going <laughs> to see a second show. And maybe one of those or two of those are going to see 20 shows before they die. And that 3.2% and how many shows they're seeing before they die, that's the front line of audience growth. For me, back to the catalyst point, is that yes, the show, they've come in this, they've seen the show, they got the post-show a little buzz, you know, they like feel a little tingle because they've just been on the receiving end of some real true honest art and they've never done that before. This is only 3%, the rest are already gone. And, <laughs> and, and we do have this moment there where, we, where the, that's the catalyst is, is, is getting them to come back. And I think for me it's about letting them know somehow without saying it, how much we adore them and need <laughs> them and value them and love them. And that without them, we would be in our showers doing this show again, or you know, in the rehearsal room. And, and, we, and we, 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 because we're artists and egomaniacs, or at least we are, um, <laughs> we, we, we don't want to admit that. We want to think they're there to see us, you know, but really we're there for them and we, through hospitality, social communication, how do we let them know that so that they get what important role they play and what we do? There's a lot of conversation this morning about um, what currently seem to be successful post performance discussions, which are not really about the book necessarily, right? But the post performance discussions that seem to be helpful, because I mean, I wonder if part of that, how do you keep that is by letting them. You know, and, say, and giving people that, that it seemed to be a power. People felt that it was powerful when they gave their audiences a chance to talk about the feelings and responses they had to the story. Not about what was wrong in the second act. Not, none of that stuff. But the, the whole kind of to the point where some theaters are doing them every night now. I mean, Joe was saying that you know, they're doing them every night, 
And Katie used the word catalyst too. And he used that. That was a, that was the, that, that conversation afterwards. Yeah. Was becoming as catalytic as the thing that was happening on as the stage. As if here should have, we, we made that happen tonight. That yeah. person shared those things. Right. We actually that's something we did tonight. That would have happened. Right. Had that person not come to the show. Right. Right. Which is something you can walk away with. But that's hard to do. I mean, that means someone's going to sit there and do that. But it's a, I think it's a it's a worthy goal, and it's and it will help us increase the the cultivation of new artists, a new theater uh, audience members. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit because we want to do some more. Are there things that things that people? What are the things that if someone objectively who's in an interview individually can ask audiences? I mean, one of the things that comes up a lot is. You know, in terms of talking about entry points and barriers, which is a common, you know, which is part of the diversity conversations so the stories. How, what do people want to see on stage? What do people want to see? How do they want to engage afterwards? Are there other things that, yeah? Well, I would say one of the biggest issues that it's like, well, I don't have to actually go there. There's no parking. And, you know, some people come from a long way. It's like, like, hey, came in, I went to see Wicked, and I did my theater for the year. It's, it's that kind of that monster so that I don't want to have to actually <laughs> you know, and I think there's a lot of that. It's like it's not my neighborhood. It's not. There's a lot of that. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know how to make that better, to other than bring it to your doorstep or bring it to you. And you well, and that's probably you know because I know a lot of people say, "Oh, I want a theater space," but I want it, you know, convenient to me too. You know, so in in the different city projects and park things, it's like, well, would you come to a park area out here? It's right. Like, right. Okay. You know. So the issue of proximity and, and how you feel about your neighborhood, <coughs> right? Yeah. Neighborhood theaters. Yeah, and it sounds so like you're you're wanting to know. It's, it's almost like logistical obstacles, maybe in the way that they're getting to the show. People want to know that their creature comes and what it comes down to. So they want to know can I park mm -hmm. and when I park, will my car be okay when I get back to it? And these are issues in neighborhoods. Yeah. yeah. And it's, if there are issues for groups that are itinerant, or groups that mm -hmm. have small spaces in publications, or groups with partnerships in, in like we move around a lot. So right. not only can I get there, I mean, am I going to eat there? Am I not going to eat there? And then also, when I get there, what is going to be expected of me, especially if you're going to be like, so are, am I going to be in the proceeding space? Am I going to be in a black box? I mean, we just don't even think about that. But a new person is sitting. And they want to have a certain kind of comfort zone. They're not going to be able to articulate what that is um, because they, they don't even know if they have those questions, but they do. And what's and what is their exchange with the artist? Is there, you know, is the artist going to be in their face and you know spitting up blood and, and you know going around and doing environmental production, or you know, really that whole physical aspect. Well, and it's interesting to think about when you in it. When you're dealing with things that move from place to place, there's an anxiety about the place. Will that supersede the desire to go see someone's work yes. in that place? Yes. Right? Because yes. 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 I go see your place, but you're doing your place somewhere new. Am I less likely to do that because of the newness of the space? Right. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to ask audiences, and I'm not a question writer. I want to know from audiences the relationship of these engagement activities that we're talking about to their propensity for word of mouth. So what engagement activities lead to more I talk about it with my friends and family? Mm -hmm. And which, while they might increase the individual impact and service provided to that audience member, don't actually impact their like talking points mm -hmm. and elevator pitch to their friend. Mm -hmm. um, it, it seems to me like we get a lot of people at my theater who really love the thing and might stick around and really engage with people, but they consistently come just the two of them. <laughs> you know, and I and I'm like, well, you seem to you seem really into it. So how come we we aren't able to move you to that next place of being that more a leader in your little family group or whatever it is. Um, and then some people do tip into that place. And it might just be them, but I, I have a feeling that it has to do partly with what we offer them. That when they get to meet an artist <coughs> and have a personal relationship, maybe they're more likely to go, or I, I actually mm -hmm. have no idea. 
Um, and I'd be interested to know not just what thing, what engagement tools add impact is interesting, but how does that impact affect their like verboseness about it in the world? Another thing that's hard to ask about that comes up a lot is the issue of barriers in price. And I'm, I'm curious if you guys have any advice on language for price. You kind of how you, this, you can't ask people is price an issue because they say yes. I, so I might ask them like, where else do you go? Because I know how much they spend to go. <laughs> so I can do that work myself. If I see that the house theater audience. Uh, is spending a third, uh, you know, if, if, a, if a third of them go to the most expensive theaters in town, I know that that third of the audience could value my work higher. If they might not. <laughs> I might push them there and they might say, actually, that's not worth $50 to me at all, um, even though I have the $50. Uh, but that's how I ask. I, it's just by asking them for else to go. And the other thing that's come up that you, that you mentioned as well is that as you look at as we look at segmentation and more kind of single ticket buying, we're seeing it in more places. I'm really, there's a there's an anxiety and a fear that we've heard a bunch that that impacts on someone's annual contribution back to the mother institution. So if you have, if you have a subscriber who's a donor to your, you know, a relatively constant donor to your place, to the extent that you're encouraging them to go other places, what are the ways, does that have an impact on the back home, or does it in fact not? And, and if that strikes, I don't know if you know that yet. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a fear that I've heard, and it's just one of those things that I wonder is if that's, you know, can we, can we widen the appetite for visiting other places without hurting the affinity, you know, can you be true to the wife when you have friend? Right? And it would be interesting to figure out how to... Right. And you know, it's a it's a lower propensity, but they still do. They still so, do. Uh, but it has to be. I would think it would be an anxiety that if your core audience goes other places more, that that will then diminish, right? And it, there, and it comes back to someone talked about metrics. Also, the metrics about do they come back to your theater? We've got these places where some of the changes in phenomenon that we're talking about have ramifications out, or we think they do, outside the marketing universe, as it were. And and I think we need. I want to. I think that's something that would be. One and, of you know, you, when you mentioned price, I mean, the other thing about the report, the Alan Brown's report, was that the two things that were missing. From the were quality and price, and arguably those are the only two things that are important. Um, you know, if I'm really being honest about the gazillions of plays that I've been involved in producing, the most consistent relationship is between my honest, brutal feeling about whether the work that is on our stage succeeded, you know, succeeded, succeeded. Uh, and the audience attendance. Right. When you succeeded, you, know, you mean aesthetically succeeded? Whether I think it was as good as it should have been, or our vision should have been, or am I blaming the audience saying, well, you know, they don't have a risk tolerance. Mm -hmm. right. No, they have plenty of risk tolerance. They don't have a tolerance for bad people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the audience we need. <laughs> we need to build a bad theater audience. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's, the, it's sort of the, the, the elephant in the room that is never discussed. Because mm -hmm. discussions like this always assume that all plays, all right. productions are created equal and are all of an equal quality and, and should be therefore sampled by people uh, with some kind of systematic regularity. And, you know, that's great, except it has absolutely nothing to do with reality. Um, there are good productions and bad productions, and, um, you know... There are good components of bad productions that will oh, bring sure. people I mean, in. But, you know, we yeah. can't, you know, we, you can't... Uh, it's really easy, because we're becoming the next, to fool ourselves and say, well, this is great because I love it and I'm passionate about it. All the critics um, were wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, the and it's, a, it's, a, it's a survival. You know, I, I mean, yeah. 
Uh, but it, without Radius Fortune, it was like, it, any playwright whose play is chosen to be produced by a theater will think the theater is crazy. Any actor who was hired to, to be in a production by a director will think the director is crazy. And any producer who gets a bad review from a critic will think the critic is crazy. And that's what we have to do to survive in this business where rejection is a way of life. I mean, you, you have to make that assumption. But the, the harder thing is to try to say, okay, you know, we produced this play, but it really didn't turn out all that well. So the, the reason that people aren't coming to see it isn't that we have inept marketing or you know, ignorant audiences. It's, it's, that it's just not very good. So let's pick up and move on. And then the, the price thing... You know, I mean, it's been it's been shown so many times in recent years. The thing that Signature did and other people have done by significantly lowering price across the board it has a tremendous impact on you know risk tolerance. Uh, yeah. There was a part in the Science report where it's like the whole thing was boiled down to uh, if it's uh, the the length, the the accessibility, and the price. So mm -hmm. if it's a uh, Half hour play that's across the street and costs five dollars. My risk tolerance is probably <laughs> yeah. pretty damn high. But <laughs> if it costs one hundred and twenty dollars and it's across town, it you know it better and it's two and a half hours long. Then it better be some story that I know really well with somebody from HBO in yeah. it. And <laughs> in a way, that's that's. You see, what's scary to me or what's challenging to me is accepting that is when someone stumbles into the theater for the first time or we get them there. And it isn't the one that succeeds 100 percent. Are there ways that what we're talking about can yeah. make it more likely that they'll come back anyway, as opposed to it becomes a career ending? I tried it, that didn't work, <laughs> and I'm not. Well, gonna, and that's good. the part that is to me is what's it, especially <coughs> because it so, seems to be so much more now about random people coming in for a single experience, and since it isn't always good. Well, I, I think the, the, the way, I mean, most everybody here is younger than I am and certainly more into social media than I am, but I know enough from the people that I work with that that's the, the great new opportunity. I mean, we was talking about it before. I mean, this is a way to communicate with people about, you know, what we're trying to do even when we fall short of right. our aspirations so that there's some tolerance of like, okay, that's what they were trying to do, I understand. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's what you, we do that with our subscribers all the time. It's, you know, humble them with, with emails and newsletters saying, okay, here's this new play, this is the idea, this is, this is what we're trying to accomplish with it. Um, uh, you know, hoping that, that if it doesn't work out, they'll but that assumes you're a subscriber because right, you're thinking, that, right, if exactly. you're not a subscriber, it wasn't free. No, but but with uh, if you can, you know, the extent to which you can make yourself available on social media and the ticket buyer right. have a chance to, to generate that, that conversation. I mean, when it, yeah, because you know. something that came up a bunch this morning is you have to be willing to let people trash you out there, too. I mean, that's oh, the other yeah. side of social media is you sure. just which is a whole new thing, I think, for a lot of, especially well, you can, you can for the writers, because it's like, you're, it's out there. We, we were talking about it, that, that, you know, it used to be, with word of mouth, it's like an art case, word of mouth, you know, ask random audience members, or ask the house manager. Well, they like the show, that's the word of mouth. You know. <laughs> yeah, they kind of like it. Okay, great, well, that really helps me a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But now, with, with social media and the blogs, I mean, when we do a show, I'll get a, like a 10-page, you know, of responses from the actual word of mouth, mm -hmm. and really hearing both good and bad, what people are saying about it. And, you know, that's just such a, uh, I mean, I never thought I'd live that long to see that kind of ability to connect with what people are thinking, and it, it helps you think about how you communicate, how you talk to people, and, and again, in most cases, giving people, um, giving our audiences the benefit of the doubt that maybe they're smarter than we think they are, and, and, and yes, 
engage more with knowledge than, than they even say that they are. When they say they are, and maybe being able to tease out if there's someone to do it. Reach out to the people who it was the first time and aren't going to say they're not going to go back again. And is, is that the key thing? Anyway, you want to say? Yeah, as I say, the the the, the, the flip side of that, though, is that there's also you need to have some institutional fortitude on some level too to say, yeah. not that the show was a dog. Hopefully, it wasn't a dog. But also, look, this wasn't a crowd pleaser. But you know what? The artists did they executed their vision the way they should have. And I, I'm gonna I'm gonna commission them again to do another play next year, even though we took, we tanked at the box office. We took a bath. You know, it was terrible. And we're going to rely on these other three shows to try and make up for the ground we lost on that one. But it is too important to the artist and to our role and our function as an organization to forward, we, we feel like, the other metrics, the uh, other boxes that we check, were hit. Like, this was, yeah, it maybe fell short in other areas, but we feel like it advanced the conversation about stuff, whatever those oh, yeah, are, yeah. in other ways. And so, there's... Like, you need to be responsive to who are you to take that in, but you also sort of also need to be able to go, you know, the, the other, most, we did other things. The too. most important thing to support an artist, an artist after they've had an unsuccessful mm. event. I mean, that's mm. what it's about. I was only talking about, you know, just being honest with ourselves. And <coughs> the no, you and you and were talking about, about that true realization you have when you go, when all is said and done, I know why this is going the way it is. We didn't do this. There's yeah. the one you fail and you do it really well and right. fail, and then there's the and one where you right. fail and, and you didn't do it as well as you could. And that's the yeah. thing that I want to send, you know, right. send the artists away and never see them again. I mean, that's <laughs> well. I think playwrights are more and more in tune with it, and especially the more money the theater costs, especially the larger your institution, I think that being able to sort of evolve constantly and understand sort of a rolling definition of successful art, mm -hmm. of a successful production, and I think one of the things that I really respect about the Goodman, and I've noticed other larger theaters do not do as well, is you guys have no public institutional hindsight in that if a show does not meet goal, if a show does not hit well with the critics, you never hear anyone from the theater say, well, the play had problems. And I can't tell you how many mm -hmm. New York theaters and DC theaters and Seattle theaters, mm -hmm. you hear it quite a lot. And I think that that the very complicated definition of success, right? And I know this is a theater producer. Almost the only metric that matters is how many tickets are sold, right? If you're looking at a night after night, if you're looking at do you have full responsive houses, that is a pretty... Well, and that's what the marketing directors who weren't... I mean, when we've had marketing directors in the room, they've said one of the really hard things now is the only metric that's applied to them as to whether or not they're doing their job well is how many tickets are sold. Not where the yeah. right people in the house, not yeah. any of the rest. And of it's it. so interesting because I think that, you know, I think back to that production of Marwa a year ago. And when we were in previews, it was my first time having a real full preview process where none of our sound cues were the same in the first preview as they were by opening. I've never experienced that before. I was really freaked out about it. I had to sort of learn to roll with it and to, to work in that. Um, in that system, which is a system that actually makes sense. Um, you know, we knew that it was going to be divisive with audiences, and my director, Eric Tengu, had to remind me about that quite a lot. And I think that um, one of the reasons that I knew that we were doing well was that, you know, I was told we made 70% of goal in the first week. And I was like, great, good, thank God for that. <laughs> and then my metric as an artist was, you know, when I left, I was there for a couple of days after opening, and I was back the home weekend for another event the theater was doing. Um, the end of the first act, which was sort of taking uh, tropes from horror movies and seeing how they would work in, in the theater. So there were a lot of very frightening elements. There were some scares to it. At the end of the first act, <coughs> the people would turn to each other and go, that was weird. <laughs> and at the end of the second act, they would turn to each other and they would say, that was weird. But, and I was like, yeah, that's what I was doing. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I was so thankful both for Eric and for Gordon Adelstein, who understood that the play was going to be divisive, who knew it going in, who reminded everyone on staff about it, who kept reminding me about it, mm -hmm. who sort of were fully behind the play and were never expecting the play to be anything that it was not, that we as artists forget quite often. And I think that when we're marketing a show or, you know, working on a show in any capacity, 
you can sort of forget that that definition of success is sort of like a shifted thing, and it's hard to keep in your mind. Um, but I really do respect institutions that sort of say, maybe we didn't do our job in this case, maybe we overestimated interest in this case, or something like that, but hopefully we're still getting closer with every show to like giving every show to do and doing it the best that we possibly can. Well, it's also just, you know, I mean, Really hard to produce a play. You can you know, stuff can go wrong that you never imagined, and you just gotta go. All right, you know, things happen. Uh, but the, the thing I want to go back to is the the, uh, the artist involvement in all of this, because I, I just in my class this morning talking about fundraising with the all students. It's, uh, you know, who here is interested in fundraising? Who here is not? <laughs> uh, <laughs> And you know, with the business model that we have, I mean, we're all involved in fundraising, and I think um, I think there's something that may be useful because I'm amazed how many times I've heard people don't do this. But um, years ago, we made the systematic decision that at all of our executive committee and board meetings, we were going to start the board meeting with um, a discussion about you know the play that we were doing or were about to do with the artists who were going to do it. And not just kind of a, you know, I mean, informal, but but thought out. Um, Somewhat to, curated. To That's really, it. yeah, to really um, try to engage people uh, on the board and try to get them to understand, again, that, you know, this is what we are attempting to do, Okay. And these are the people who are attempting to do it, and this is why they are passionate about it, and this is why they care. And also, when it's really going to be, you know, ugly because of the content of the play, to tell them it's really going to be ugly. I mean, Bob is great about that. He will say to the board, "You are going to go and see this, and you may hate it, or your friends are going to go and see it." And so, I might advise you, you know, to be careful which friends you bring to this play because you do one of those experiences. But we often. Um, make a long story short, we often forget how civilians are, in my experience, enamored of what we do. They're actually in awe of it. They're, they're, they're really much less judgmental than they are sort of amazed that, you know, you can go on stage and remember all of those lines. <laughs> <laughs> or that you can, you know, sit in a room and imagine these characters. And so, uh, to, you know, to approach them from that standpoint, that, that these aren't my executioners, these are people who actually are fascinated by what I do, and sort of, the more that artists share that, uh, both with audiences, but, you know, again, even even at small theaters, I mean, I have to, some people would say, well, it's a small theater, and there's like four or five board members. So what? You know? I mean, I've been on boards of small theaters, and I do don't see Do you think about anymore. having that conversation with them? online for your audiences as well? I sometimes think we give more to our boards than we do to our larger... Well, we're doing, we're doing more of that now because we have, you know, stuff. I mean, we had a wonderful kid who showed up a couple of years ago and was a videographer and right. said, hire him! <laughs> and so now, you know, he does, like, sequential... the story of the play from the first rehearsal to its actual performance, so you like week by week you get a new chapter online. Um, so I mean, there's still more to be done, but we send those links out to, to audiences and stuff like that. I mean, that's if you have the technology, it's it's really easy to do. One of the things that intrigued me it, it was either a self post rep or something from both, and in some of Alan's work was, and I think it was the subscribers that had the largest tendency to say they were able to go to a show that they didn't like, but, and still have a successful evening at the yeah. theater, mm -hmm. right? And so, and, I, and it was encouraging that it was, in fact, the subscribers who had a greater capacity for, that knew, basically, they had a skill for, I think, for being able to which do that. Which comes in, which I think plays into that, one of the kind of disparities of the, of the theaters being quite clear that the audiences that were actually the most preferable for what they saw as was the subscribers and the playwrights saying that the theaters that they thought were the most likely yeah, to be supportive right. of that right. were the absolute opposite right. of subscribers. And I read it and I thought, I wonder if this is people projecting themselves on who they think. Yeah. But in fact, I think it is probably the more we drill down, 
that it is that subscriber audience that is, at the end of the day, much more tolerant. And the question is how to get younger, younger artists to see the tolerance because they don't look like they don't look like what we want the person who likes our work to look like, <laughs> right? And that there's some, but that, but because I think that's a source of friction. What? It's not paid. Like if you have more money, so you can afford to take more risks, then you're going to be more tolerant. Of I wonder um, if that's part of it. I don't. I mean, I don't. I mean, I know certainly when I was younger, I would be very particular about what I wanted to go to because I only had this much money. Mm, right. And so if I went and I spent money on something. appreciation that is built in about, okay, I didn't love the story, or I, that actor bothered me, but you know, they were able to find that, you, you were saying, I'm sorry, the, the microphone, um, saying that, you know, that even in bad shows there are good elements, right? Are, are, there a, are they able to glean out and, 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 and take away things that make me feel like I did not just waste two hours of my life? Because some of those people who have a lot of money, I mean, nobody has a ton of time, but a lot of them be like, I don't have much time, right? I mean, money coming on my ears, but what I do with my time is really important. And did I just waste two or three hours of my time, or do I feel like, you know, that was still really much better than sitting at home watching TV, yeah. because I, I got actually, blah, blah, blah. I had a person come up to me recently, actually, at a, a show that just, a show went to just close at 16th Street Theater, and she said, you're the person who wrote the dentist play a few years ago? And I was like, oh yeah, that's me. She's like, oh wow, I hated that play. <laughs> uh, oh, cool. Uh, but she remembered like everything she hated about the play. <laughs> <laughs> that's I love. I think, you know, I, I, I feel like as an artist, my worst case scenario is an audience coming out of, of a play of mine or a play that a company I'm affiliated with does. And they go, it was good. And then they drive home. And that's right. the end of the conversation. Right. Horrified so that. That may be where the feeling about subscribers comes from because they think they don't external I when I teach, I have my class go through the exercise of how do you decide to see a play if you're a subscriber and basically, you know, you go to the place you have supper where you usually have supper and you park and you usually park and you get and, and if you're a single ticket buyer, what do you do? You read about the play, you decide to see the play, you have to decide who you want to invite. And of course, you bring in a different level of, of expectation, which may then lead to that part where they leave and need, right? And, and so it's like some of this is how do, we, how do we help everyone understand each other? Because they may leave and say, that was good. And they actually really are feeling the things you want them to be feeling, but you're not seeing it. It sounded like there was something else that you wanted to add, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think. I think it's very much, and you know, this goes back to a number of things that we're talking about, um, and what I tried to sort of start to talk about earlier. Um, but we're, you know, we're talking about making the theatrical experience something that, you know, even if someone feels they have a negative experience, what is it that can, they can still take away and they come back for? And I think it's, you know, all of these things that we're talking about all tie in. And for me, I think it's very much about us making it an event. You know, we're living in a society now that has changed dramatically, and it is now the I society. So, you know, we're talking about the fact that um, people love actors, and you know, we look at actors and we can't understand how they can remember all those lines. And yes, they're amazing, and we want we want to have a part of that. But also, we want to be able to do that. Like, I know that people say that they can't do it; they still want to feel that they are a part and able to do it. You know, I think 
the way television has set itself up now, and the, you know, the whole idea of um, reality TV makes people believe that they can be a television star. And I feel like that, you know, theatre, in some respects, needs to find a way of creating an event where they have that same experience, where when they're sitting at home watching TV and watching reality, or as as reality TV, and they think, oh, yes, I'm part of TV, because I'm watching people that are normal people. Or I How, voted for them. Yeah, exactly. How do we make that experience an event, you know, on any kind of level? And the only reason I say that, and what my example was earlier, was I said, you know, there's this thing in, in England where they did, where nobody knew what they were ever going to see. So it had nothing to do with what they were seeing. It had, it was purely about the event. It was purely about everyone coming together. How do we make theatre an event? And is it that, you know, the thing that, you know, I hear us all talking about so much is, you know, it's still about us, when actually we need to start thinking it's actually about them. And they are, you know, and they are, they are the stars of the theatre now, you know? And that's, that's just something that we can't escape, is the fact that it is the I generation. That's what we're about. It's about Twitter. It's about Facebook. We are no longer in control of what we necessarily do. How do we get control? We have to start manipulating our audience into thinking that they are actually doing it. Yeah, I think that that is, I had a discussion with a friend the other day. I also sort of come from the world of video games. And I, I had a long talk with a friend the other day because she thought that sort of the act of playing the game um, it was a very passive experience. And I was like, actually, I have had more engagement games than I have had in some theater productions. And I think that asking the audience to do something, and I know that when theater people talk about interactivity, we think of like choose your own adventure theater, and we, I feel like we don't quite have the tools to talk about it the way that some other industries have the tools to talk about it. So in games, you're always talking about the game mechanic, and what is the player going to do at this point so they're not just watching a movie. And I think that that is huge, that the act of playing a game you are not a passive observer, you are an active participant um, in the story that is unfolding. And so the reason that it can feel epic is because you are the caretaker for this eight-year-old girl and you have to get her safely through this area. Or you are saving the world, or you are sort of interacting with the environment. And I think that even if we're not fundamentally, and some of us will never, if, if, even if we're not fundamentally changing the form of the, of the productions we do, even if we're not, if we're choosing not to innovate there, which I think is a totally valid choice, how can we then make that engagement with the audience, whether that's something that we're going to purchase, whether that's something before they sit down, something in your mission, something after the play, something you're going to email, anything like that. What can we ask the audience to do? There have been people talking about where do you, without ceding control of the story and Absolutely. the production, which you don't think we want to do. I mean, audiences most of us don't want, want it. Audiences don't want people and audiences there. probably don't really agree yeah. because watch how they flee the front row if they think they have to go on stage, yeah. right? Yeah. They <laughs> don't think people bands. want what? Spencer sure. last year, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think there's a. But what can you say? I think we're talking about form, you know, and, and, and I think, you know, I was fortunate enough to be on Howard Chalowitz's panel at the TCG conference in Boston about innovation, and he went and spoke to people all over the country and was able to learn a lot from him and his, what he learned. And, uh, you know, his big thing was in Europe and South America, you know, the, the, they don't have this assembly line that we have here. And if you really want to change form, you have to be innovative. And the way to do that is to get the playwright and the director and the actors, most importantly, because they might have the best ideation of anybody. Um, but the marketing people, get everybody in the room at the beginning, before you decide, where you're going, and 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 let let the ensemble form and, and and develop a vision together. And I think it's a tricky thing because playwrights have been used to being the, the generators, and then they hand it to the theater company, and then the director gets it, and he makes or she makes all their decisions, and then they get the desires on board, and the actors are brought in at the last moment. And if we really want to push form and do stuff like Sleep No More, which does have twenty six year olds that have seen the show 30 times At least. and they're running at full speed and they know where to go they they know they're blocking it's really i mean that's like the second the show is wonderful the experience is great but being there as a theater artist and watching these 
these like people running at full speed up and down flights of stairs. Audience members so like in the moment. That was part of the show too. Having paid seventy five dollars at yeah. least to be there each time. Yeah, and then buy the program on the way out for sixty. Right. But if I'm hearing you though, I, if, if I'm understanding you, it's like that. Yes, absolutely. It's a it's a very exciting and viable option, but. <coughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good night. Yeah, um, <laughs> oh my God. Okay. Hi, Alan. Um But also, it seems like we're also talking about are there other strategies that don't necessarily involve reinventing the form, but, right? Like, because I'm thinking about like Stage Kiss is the Sarah Rule play. It's a play of two horizons right now. And one interesting thing that they're doing is they have created a kissing booth in the lobby of the theater, and you can take your picture kissing whoever you're with. Or they actually sometimes encourage kids or random stranger, but whatever. And then they will not only put your picture on the wall of the theater, but then they instantly have it set up so that you can Instagram yourself on their page. You don't have to do. No, you don't have to. But I think it's not quite next week. What does that mean after? Yeah, seriously. Putting that out there. But it seems like that. Is, is that an example, too, of what we're talking about? Of like, here's an entry point for those who want it, and you can sort of. It is kind of a way, I think, of manipulating the audience to be like, oh, I stage kissed and Instagrammed and I'm on playwrights or on speed or whatever. But yeah. why are we so far in? Why are we already at opening when the audience mm -hmm. gets engaged, right? Mm -hmm. So you're talking about getting everyone together in the room early on and where is the audience mm -hmm. that, right? Um, I mean, we all scoff at crowdsourcing curation, but there are some really, really apt examples of it working on. Um, it was about using in California the Surf Museum. It was like a totally failed museum, and some you know young curator took it over and crowdsourced it, and it is now a center of the community, and it is you know beautifully curated and by community members. And so there are there are some orchestra. I'm gonna mess it up, but you can swear it. Philly, someone is actually you know crowdsourcing curation of one of the concerts they will do in the series, and you can bet if you voted. On like eight, you know, they limit the options, but if you voted and your vote won or your vote lost, you're probably going to show up, right? Um, I don't think it's something to totally scoff at, but you know, it's into a, to a selection place to, to get them involved a year and a half out instead of, you know, even though it's a very cool, fun thing at, you know, opening night. I think mm -hmm. it's something we're going to. It used to be enough to take out a big page ad in the New York Times. And it's just not enough anymore, right? We have to That's Amazon.com's TV now. model where they show the nine pilots. Uh, and then you vote yeah. the pilots and yeah. then the five to get the most votes go to series. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and it's also, and I think it, it sort of speaks more to the, to, to not necessarily stop marketing the institution because, I mean, Rock, even as you said it, I never thought about, obviously institutions are fine. As an individual, it is not something I've ever thought about before in my life, so it's a very good thing. Um, but I think that it's that, that additional sense of how every project we're doing is different. It might not be super different form-wise, but it might be. You know, like Looking Glass is a great example. Like, a, like an ensemble-based show is going to have a different form than like the production of Bengal Piper or the Bad Bad Zoo. You know? So doesn't it make sense, even though we're all exhausted and who has time and who has the money and the resources and all of that stuff. I feel like the longer we make theater, the more it makes sense that we are thinking not just about a season, but we're thinking about a show. And are we starting at opening for one show and are we starting a year ahead of time for another show? I've talked with Howard extensively, extensively <laughs> about that subject, but some things I really agree with him and other things I don't agree with him. And I think it's, um, Again, use use different models for different shows, mm -hmm. and I think that it's it's sort of part of our job as artists to sort of say, how is this different? How is this show connecting differently to the audience? What is the timeline? What is the form that it takes? What is the before? What is the during? What is the after? Um, that all of that is honestly just as important as each artwork that we're creating. Um, that it's not sort of an addition to it, that it sort of needs to be thought of. Part and parcel is the same thing. Well, and, and as you talk about time, the balancing act, we talked a little this morning about the, the, the balancing act between the need to, to
to generate a lot of product for a lot of reasons, and the fact that time is the commodity we don't have to need the most, maybe. Mm-hmm. As much as anything else, it just the, the, how do you how do you have the time to to deal with each production individually? When certainly when you're producing a season, there's the one you're in, there's the one that's running, is what right? And how do you figure that out? Mm-hmm. And how do you get to it a year ahead of time? Mm-hmm. That would be good. Yeah, and I think it might actually be interesting, especially for generative artists. It might be sort of interesting to say. Hey, generative artist or playwright, if you had fifteen hundred dollars, that was just your budget, and you could only just use that to pay yourself, or you could use a thousand of that to pay yourself, and five hundred dollars to pay for whatever, and you have this amount of time, then you give us a plan for what a process of outside engagement would look like. Now, that's not work that I'm capable of doing when I'm in production, because I'm in production when I'm in production. But in the six months leading up to it, I'm probably not doing anything at all, honestly. So, you know, it, it might be a worthy experiment to sort of say, artist, what's your plan? And then sort of measure the success mm-hmm. a few seasons into that. Mm-hmm. Grant writers, grant writers. I feel like small companies, smaller, I mean, obviously our, our big awesome companies have, or maybe not obviously, hopefully have community engagement and like in terms of marketing people and maybe an education arm or whatever. But I think we're reaching the point where it really is evolve or die, right? And I, I, can't, I used to work at PS122 in New York, which was an artist-run space when it started in the 80s. And then eventually, they were like, oh, we need someone to manage the space. So they bring on someone to manage the space. And eventually, you realize what you need, what you need. And now we need all the little companies, maybe rather than hiring whatever it was you were going to hire, hire an engagement. You know, I think we've hit that point where we all have to admit that social media exists and, you know, and that this we're just, is how we We're just different, you know, Fox, you know, the network, they RIP pilot season this year. Instead of right. spending, you know, $5 million on 20 possible pilots and picking up 10 to series and canceling seven of those, they were like, screw it. We're not going to do pilot season. We're going to go straight to series. But instead of ordering twenty <coughs> pilot seasons, we're going to order ten, or we'll order eight. Yeah. And we're going to sort of see how that experiment works. But I think the TV is sort of at the same phase of evolve or die. And I think we can sort of um, make it fun or not. It's it's funny figuring out where to throw your energies in this kind of thing. Even though we we see change and go, we should be responsive to that change. And this story would be so much more effective if I could remember the name of any of the players involved. But, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right? It's just make make them them fantastic yeah, on yeah. this because, hey. <laughs> no, but I was at the IP conference uh, a couple months ago, and uh, one of the little sessions, there was a theater producer who had brought in a European company and was like, we're going to really connect with the colleges. And they, with uh, the first preview, they brought in a big college group. And uh, they were all wanted to be all alive to this social media thing, and they'd somehow put monitors in the lobby, and you were supposed to be able to like do something interactive or something right there. And the play happened. The students walked in, glanced around those things, didn't touch them, walked out, and they were like, "I'm not sure they responded to it." And they went to bed all demoralized. And when they woke up in the morning, they saw that a student had found one of the performers on Facebook and said, where is the cast going tonight? And like half of that student group went and joined the cast at a party. <laughs> and like nothing they did with da 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 here's our <laughs> you know, engagement thing, did what they planned. But there was, they, the students went, we're going straight to the artists because we can find them. So it's it's just tricky to navigate, I think. Mm-hmm. But, I, mean, I, I would say, and, and I don't know if you still do it, like, but I, I have been asking yes. people for playwrights whenever I talk to them in the last years. We've been doing this stuff. Can you just tell me your most successful marketing experience or interaction in the marketing department? And I don't remember who the writer was, but they were doing a play at the Goodman, and they said, "There's this guy at the Goodman. Um, I think he's in charge, Rock something. Or other. <laughs> he has." He opens up his office on Fridays at five or whatever. And, they, and anyone who want anyone who's in the building can come 
for Draco to hang out. And she said, and I didn't know if I should go, but I was a playwright. But I went up and I started, didn't know anyone. I didn't. And she ended up talking to a marketing associate. And they said, tell me mm -hmm. about your play. And that became the graphic, right? I mean, out of that. And so I think you're exactly right. It's some combination of find the artist, find the person. I was just thinking, it just, I was reminded of that because I was thinking about tech, and I was thinking about those kids knew how to find the actors. Right. And so it's people react to what they react to. So there are a bunch of different solutions, I think, to how we figure out what the, what, and it's using all of, I, I, I just sometimes get scared that we'll do, you know, we, we need all the social engagement, but we also, it's, we also need a bar in the building. The, oh, wait. Uh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, way to find the actors. Or, and she obviously didn't, she wasn't scared because she didn't know enough, right? I mean, it was just like, oh, let's go upstairs and, or wherever it was. And it was, but it, and those kids, I mean, who would, I would never do that. Never have had the nerve to do that, right? <laughs> so I don't know. I just want to, uh, something that Laura said like 45 minutes ago. I th just thought was interesting in terms of success. Because I just had a play done in London, and time it was kind of to ask me how that went. And I said it went well. It started four years ago at the Nuffield Theater in Southampton. Are you familiar? Do you know the Nuffield? I do. There we go. So, and we did it first there, and I was paid the ultimate compliment by the managing director, who said, <coughs> Your play did not lose as much money as we thought it was going to. <laughs> you know, and I think like 30 years ago, I would have gone home and curled up in bed, but now I'm like, man, that is great. Like, we're going to put that on the banner? And, uh, but that is the success. That is, that is the definition of success in the not for profit world. Mm -hmm. Uh, and years. Years. <laughs> it's more uh, so here's so here's a, a possible uh, yeah, it's tell me. Up, but it's not terribly helpful. But I, 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 I do think that you know we, so there's there's a there's um, we as theater institutions have accountability to the public, right? We also have accountability to the artists, and and not those are our tensions are at war with each other, but sometimes they can be uh, conflicting. Um, but uh, so so we've talked about risk taking for the audiences and a little bit for the artists. I mean, I think what we can continue to do is a better job of advocating and educating the funding community for exactly that reason, because it's a given that theaters are going to lose money, and the only way that they're going to survive, I mean, for the most part, mm -hmm. is if and and the only way specifically that risk taking is going to be survive is if we have a funding community that says. It's valuable, it is essential to the city of Chicago that we have institutions, small, medium, and large, that are going to continue to take risks and do work that hasn't been done before, try new adventures, and give offer new adventures to our audiences. But the longevity of those institutions isn't going to be terribly long if there's not the support to help make that happen. So, I, I mean, at least our institution is really thinking about uh, how this a lot, as our risk margin has, has really shrunk down to kind of almost nil. You know, like we need to figure out how to expand that risk margin again because because we do. Um, and one of the ways that we're going to need to do that is to be out in the field and educating those funders and advocating for that across the board. Well, and, and it, the, yeah. the only thing I'd add to that is it gets back to the price thing and the whole business model where you know, uh, educating funders and, and trustees that the, the uh, measure of success is not how many dollars you can extract from people coming through your door yes. one way or the other. Uh, that's yes. not what it's about. So right. if, if we could charge lower prices, if we, if we had a business model that didn't say you had to get, you know, 60, 70 percent, then, I mean, and, you know, we, because of technology, we've learned this because we do dynamic pricing both directions. And so now, if the show starts out and demand is sluggish, you lower the prices. And you know what? When you lower the prices, you see demand go up. Uh, and so, I mean, again, sometimes I think we get, you know, we get so in our heads about problems that we can overcomplicate the fact that there are solutions that are, you know, simple. I mean, risk is risky. Some, some plays are, some productions are better than others, and you know, if 
Uh, tickets cost less, more people will probably go to see them. Yeah. <laughs> and if you have drinks in the office, the artists will come. No, free pizza. Free pizza. <laughs> <laughs> free pizza. Everyone, we're starting free pizza nights next year because we've learned, you know, <laughs> I'm free pizza. People are there. I'll, I'll buy a ticket to go see yeah. them. Yeah. Also, I, I, this is something that the, yeah. in the circles says one, but um, I don't think an audience member is not something that random money time. I think that theater is a special particularity, and I don't think, I do not know who we're talking to all the time when we want to talk to our audience, we want to know what happened, but I don't think there's one audience member who's a random person. I don't think there's a random person who's walking down the street and said, oh, there's a good, no, there's a station I'll just check it out. <laughs> you know. Uh, because you have to, you have to synthesize too much information, both when you're in here and also just to get to the experience. Mm -hmm. So I think the, mm -hmm. because you can figure out mm -hmm. what it is about those people that they're not doing. And the bad thing that is that they're just not because in the great world, there's a kind of education going around to make all those people. Okay. We're at four, and we're going to We've done our time on HowlRound. Good night, HowlRound. Um, so thank you guys for your time. This has been really an amazing day. And for those of you who have been here since this morning, thanks to you and thanks to everyone who came this afternoon as well. It's been really, really great for us. So for keeping up the next steps.